Good evening. I call this meeting to order the Dr. Cog Board of Directors for Wednesday, November 15th, 2023. This is your chair, Steve Conklin. Uh, if you're able, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you very much. Uh, I will mention that uh, Melinda is not here this evening, so we are very happy to have Cam Kennedy filling in. Thank you, Cam, for being here. We appreciate that very, very much. He is, of course, the parking guy, so if you park downstairs, be sure to get your parking pass. <laughs> uh, do want to welcome a new member, Wendy Padilla, from the town of Frederick. Welcome. We are glad to have you here tonight. And with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Kennedy for the roll call. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, for Adams County, we have Steve Odoricio. Thank you. Uh, Arapahoe County, Jeff Baker. Here. Thank you. Uh, Boulder County, Claire Levy. Here. Thank you. There you are. Uh, City and County of Broomfield, Austin Ward. Okay. Uh, how about James Marsh Holshin? Okay. Uh, Clear Creek County, Randy Wheelock. Uh, George Marlin, no. uh, City and County of Denver, Nicholas Williams, Here. thank you, uh, and Kevin Flynn. Here. Yes, you are. Uh, Douglas County, George Teal. Uh, okay. Uh, how about Abe Layden? Uh, Gilpin County, Mary Mornis. Uh, Jefferson County, Tracy Kraft Tharp. Okay. Uh, how about Leslie? Del Kemper, thank you. Is she here? Okay. Um, City of Arvada, Lisa Ferre. Uh, Bob Pfeiffer. Uh, City of Aurora, uh, Dustin Zivonik. Uh, Juan Mercano. Okay. Uh, Town of Bennett, Larry Vidim. Sure. Yes, you are. Um, and then City of Blackhawk, David Spellman. The, okay. City of Boulder, Nicole Spear. Uh, town of Beaumont, Margo Ramsden. City of Brighton, Jan Polinski. City of Castle Pines, Deborah Mulvey. Here. Thank you. Uh, town of Castle Rock, Tim Dietz. Uh, Jason Gray. Uh, City of Centennial, Tammy Maher. Or Mike Sutherland. Thank you. Uh, City of Central, Todd Williams. Uh, City of Cherry Hills Village, Randy Wheel. Thank you. Uh, Town of Columbine Valley, empty. Uh, City of Commerce City, Craig Hurst, or Susan Noble. Uh, City of Decono, Catherine Whitman. Uh, City of Edgewater, Steve Conklin. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, City of Inglewood, Othaniel Sierra, or Cheryl Wink. Uh, Town of Erie, Ari Harrison, or Sarah Laughlin. No. City of Federal Heights, Linda Montoya, or Sonia Jensen. Town of Firestone, Don Cognac, or David Whelan. Uh, Town of Foxfield, Josie Cockrell or Lisa Jones. Uh, Town of Frederick, Wendy Padilla. Thank you. Uh, Town of Georgetown, Lynette Kelsey. Thank you. Uh, City of Glendale, Rachel Blinkley. Uh, Ryan Tushur. City of Golden, Paul Hazeman. Thank you. Uh, City of Greenwood Village, George Lance, or David Kerber. Uh, City of Idaho Springs, Chuck Harmon. City of Lafayette, Stephanie Walton. Hello. Hello. <coughs> uh, City of Lakewood, Jeslyn Charzai. Thank you. Town of Lark Larksburg, Isaac Levy. City of Littleton, Stephen Barr. Here. 
Thank you. Uh, Town of Lock Bowie, Kate Bresto. Here. Thank you. Uh, City of Lone Tree, Wynne Shaw. Present. Thank you. Uh, City of Longmont, Joan Peck. Okay. City of Louisville, Dietrich Hoffner. Or Deborah Fahey. City of Lyons, Holly Rogan. Or Greg Eating. Uh, Town of Mead, Colleen Whitlow. Here. Thank you. Town of Morrison, Paul Sutton. Or Adam Way. Okay. Town of uh, Ninderland, Tom. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, City of North Glen, Richard Kondo, or Tim Long. Town of Parker, John Dyack. Here. Thank you. City of Sheridan, Sally Daigle. Okay. Town of Superior, Neil Shaw. Here. Thank you. Uh, City of Thornton, Jessica Sandgren, or Julia Marvin. City of Westminster, Sarah Normella. Thank you. Uh, City of Wheat Ridge, Bud Starker. Present. Thank you. Uh, for CDOT, we have Darius Pakbaz. Sure. Thank you. Uh, and for City, of, uh, and for CDOT, we have Sally Sheffy. Okay. Uh, and then RTD Brian Welch. Right here. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Chair, that is our attendance. You know, Melinda does that every meeting and makes it look incredibly easy. It's it's not easy. It's not easy. So thank you because. <laughs> That's that's a lot to go through. So from now on, the meeting is easy for you. Okay. So, uh, and we do have at least one person that is, is participating virtually. Correct. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, that is correct. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, do I have a motion to approve the agenda? Thank you very much. Motion and second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. And any abstentions? Okay, thank you very much. We have an agenda. Uh, report of the chair. I, I will have something coming up in a moment, but we will start with the report of the Performance and Engagement Committee. Uh, Commissioner Jeff Baker, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We had one action item tonight. We did select um, Council Member Jeslyn Sherazai from Lakewood to be the um, uh, nominating committee member from P&E. We also went into an executive session and uh, had a discussion, direction, and action concerning the executive director's performance evaluation, for which when we came out of executive session, we gave guidance to staff. My report. And, and I think the fact that Mr. Rex is sitting here with us tonight shows that probably went okay. Report of the finance and... <laughs> <laughs> Report of the Finance and Budget Committee, uh, Colin Whitlow. Thank you, Chair. Mayor of the Town of Meath. Thank you, Chair. We had two meetings tonight. One was the regional response uh, presentation for the audit by Clifton Larson and Allen. In our second meeting, we had two action items. And we did select a representative from the city of Lit Littleton. Mr. Stephen Barr will be our nominating and on the nominating committee. So thank you, sir, for stepping up. And we did approve a resolution authorizing the executive director tonight to negotiate and execute a contract with Sanborn Map Company in the amount not to exceed $750,000 and near map in the amount not to exceed $450,000, each for two-year terms for 2024 and 2025, aerial imagery and related products and services. Mr. Chair, that is my report. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. And thank you to the folks serving on both of those committees. Very much appreciated. A couple of housekeeping things. I mentioned the parking passes that CAM has. If you're parked in the garage downstairs, that will get you out. Uh, also, restrooms down the hallway out there. And we have cookies and coffee and some soft drinks in the hallway as well. So help yourself. Um, there was this thing called a pandemic, I guess, that happened. We remember that, right? That kind of changed a lot of things that were going on. We had a tradition that, like many of our traditions, kind of hit a little bit of a roadblock when suddenly we weren't in person and, and other things happened, and that is recognizing length of service to Dr. Cog. We call it the block of wood. <laughs> it's a block of wood. If the end times come, you can use it for firewood probably, but until then, uh, it, is, it is made out of beetle kill wood, uh, and this is a replica of what is called Mount Blue Sky, the old Mount Evans. 
and these are five-year awards. Uh, we're going to present some of these tonight. Um, again, this is kind of lagged, so some of these folks may have seven, 30, 40 years. No, <laughs> may have may have may have more uh, more years of service. But uh, and not everybody that is being recognized is here tonight. But we do want, want to recognize the folks that that are receiving this very cool. Uh, John Dyack will trade this for. You've got what a clock. I have a I have a five year clock uh, that I got six years ago. If anybody wants a clock, I'm interested in a trade. Bear with us for just one moment. Okay, I'm also. Oh, wait, Doug I'm has to give another uh, yeah, explanation. Yeah, I, I gotta I gotta also share this. Um, yes, part of it was the pandemic, but also we were waiting for the, the, the formal designation of the name change from Evans to Blue Sky, which took a lot longer than a lot of people thought it would. And also, because there was such a lag, you'll notice that there's a few that are larger than this, right? It's because they don't make the large ones anymore, I think. So I don't want you to think we're, you know, we're, you know, we think highly of some and not others, but... Just so you know. I just realized these also could be probably used in a version of Jenga. Uh, <laughs> not necessarily. But anyway, so we'll, we'll make it through these. Uh, I do want to acknowledge the folks that are uh, recognized that are not here tonight. Tammy Maurer from Centennial, Sally Daigle from Sheridan, Joan Peck from Longmont, uh, Randy Wheelock from Clear Creek County, Jessica Sandgren from Thornton uh, are, we'll get these to them, but they are not here this evening. Um, we're going to start, and, and, and Director Venom, this does not mean that you're any smaller than the rest. You, <laughs> you, you've got one of the small ones. Oh, yeah. Woo-hoo! Uh, and I may say a couple things about, about at least a couple of these folks. Director Vidden, uh, as we were sitting here tonight, I told him how much value he brings to the board. Uh, from the town of Bennett, it would be very easy for him not to be engaged. It's a little bit of a trip to get here. Uh, you, you provide excellent perspective, excellent questions. You're here with us at least until April. He's debating what he does after that point in time. But thank you very much for your service, and thanks for being here. Next up, uh, one of our two City of Denver representatives, Nicholas Williams, is a staff member from Denver, and he has five years of service. We've been here five years already? And has never missed a meeting. That's true. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Uh, Nicholas, Nicholas, we great, greatly value your service and your time here, your perspective. Uh, you've served on committees. You, you uh, absolutely have been a, a key part of Dr. Cox. So thank you very much for that. Okay. I am really bummed that, that this is probably the last meeting of this individual, term limited in her community. Stephanie Walton. Stephanie, you have just been absolutely fantastic uh, representing Lafayette. Uh, your committee service, your questions here, your, your friendly uh, greeting when roll call happens. Uh, just from beginning to end, you've been a delight to work with. Thank you so much. This is going smoothly, don't you think? <laughs> Wynn Shaw, our uh, the, the vice chair, who will be your chair coming up next year. Wynn, thank you for your service from uh, Lone Tree.
Devine Flan. Oh, no, Kevin Flynn. Devine <laughs> Kevin is our immediate past chair, so he served as chair prior to me. Excellent role model, uh, somebody that I respect a great deal. Uh, a newspaper man who you know transitioned into working with transportation and, and RTD. Uh, most impressively, he is a accomplished writer that has a movie that will be out next fall. So, so it's starring Jude, Jude Law. So that's pretty impressive. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about that as time goes on. But thank you, Kevin. Congratulations. Commissioner Jeff Baker. County, thank you for your service. Uh, Jeff is currently our uh, chair of performance and engagement and will be your chair in a couple of years. Okay. Bud Starker, uh, your sense of calm, your ability to deal with difficult situations is very much appreciated. We'll leave it, we'll leave that at that. Uh, and and we appreciate your service. And I'm I'm excited that I get to be mayor of the community right immediately next to you, Wheat Ridge and Edgewater. So, So of, of this group, there are probably two people I think of, of most in terms of, of experience coming to meetings, and it's, it's Bud Starker, who I sat next to for many, many, many of these meetings, uh, and next to him is Lynette Kelsey. And Lynette Kelsey is one of my favorite people in the entire world. Uh, sat next to her in the old building. Uh, she is just a, a joy to work with from Georgetown. She is police judge, police judge. That's kind of a cool title to have. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and <laughs> you were actually the first one in the box. I pulled it out as, as the example. Uh, our uh, chair of finance and budget, our treasurer, and will be chair of this August body hopefully in the uh, coming years. And just, again, a joy to work with. I first came to, to know Colleen going to CML, and I would go to the woman in government breakfast as, a, as an ally, as an advocate for, for, for strong women in government. And you were so involved in that, and it did such a good job. And I think that's the first time we really got to know each other. So it's been a joy to work with you here as well. So traditions can be fun. So uh, apologize that they all came kind of at once. You know, that's something that typically would be done on a little bit more of a rolling basis. But uh, thanks to staff, thanks to, to Flo and Doug and other folks that have helped make those, those awards a possibility. And thanks to everybody with five years of service. And thanks to everybody with one day of service. You know, whether you're, you're here for the first time or you've been here for a long, long time, your effort, your work, being here is very much appreciated, so thank you very much. And with that, here's Doug. Oh, all righty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much, and good evening, everybody. With those short numbers tonight, uh, NLC is going on, so uh, I know we have actually a director condo was 
planning on calling in online. It's doing, uh, appreciate him doing double duty up there, which is great. I just have a few things I wanted to mention to you. First, um, just give you a quick update on our regional housing assessment. We're in full swing now with the advisory group, which is made up of subject matter experts from many of the housing related fields from developers, economists, housing providers, um, Housing finance, municipal and state government reps, uh, they kicked off on November 2nd. We have another one coming up on December on December 13th. And uh, I wasn't at the first one, but, she, but Sheila said it was excellent. They had a really, really good conversation, which is, which is wonderful. And so beyond the advisory group, we are engaging um, many in, uh, in uh, we're hosting two stakeholder conversations on November 29th and 30th, one with local staff and, and, then, uh, and then another with climate related groups. Um, these are the first of, of many that we anticipate that we'll be having, so stay tuned. And when we'll be um, continuing our, our stakeholder conversations through December and January, um, and we will be hosting a board work session on January 3rd uh, for the consultants to share their early findings and analysis. So. Stay tuned to that. We're really excited about, about the work that's going on in the housing area. Um, Urban Land Institute, technical assistance panels. Um, for those that have been around for a little while, those who received the blocks of wood tonight, you know that we've, we've uh, Dr. Cog has um, uh, sponsored two uh, what we call TAPs from ULI uh, every year for quite some time now. Um, so the, what the, these TAPs are, they're, they're services offered by ULI that bring real estate planning, development experts together to provide pragmatic advice for addressing complex land use and real estate development issues. So we're in the process right now of, of hopefully courting some, some local communities to participate in that. The deadline is this Friday. So if you have a particular interest, please let us know. We are, staff is reaching out to your staff and we believe we got at least a, at least a few on the hook here. So, um, but if you have a particular interest or a, a particular project in mind, please reach out to myself or Sheila and we'll be sure to follow up with your staffs. Um, let me see here, Gotober. Um, I, I, real quick, I just wanted to wrap this up. Gotober was our annual event that we do and. Um, that was hosted by the Way to Go Partnership, um, which is an annual campaign that encourages employers and staff to use eco-friendly commuting options during the month. 79 employer, employers participated. 886 employees tracked more than 18,000 eco-friendly trips. Um, and we had five winners in the, in the various size categories. Uh, in the largest size, Denver Water won. Uh, next to that was uh, PCL Construction and then A&E Design, OTAC Inc., and in the very small employee category, uh, the Regional Air Quality Council, go figure, they, they, they won that award. So the winning companies will be featured in the Denver Business Journal with a paid ad. So uh, congratulations to all the participants, but in most notably the winners. Um, the last thing I would like to mention is I had the opportunity today to attend the Douglas County State of the County. Uh, it was a really wonderful event. I know uh, Director Shaw and Director Dyack was there. Um, and I, I must say they, they, they had a couple videos. They went through many other departments in the programs. Wonderful videos associated with um, older adults. They, they did a tremendous job. And the work that they're doing down there I think is, is top notch. Um, also on the, the, the veterans uh, video I thought was really, really good as well. And that's dear to our hearts because we have a – uh, veterans director program here at Dr. Cog as well. So I just want to thank them for doing such a wonderful job and for, for uh, the invitation. Um, if you all have similar events, I would truly enjoy an invite. I'd like going to those. It lends some perspective on the work that's being done in the counties and the cities. So please keep me on, keep me on, on your, on your uh, invitation list. Um, last but not least, I just want to wish everybody a, a wonderful and safe Thanksgiving. Um, be safe out there. If you're traveling, boy, oh, boy, I saw the numbers they're expecting at DIA. It's just, it's crazy. Excuse me, Dan, Dan. I know, I know, Nicholas. Yeah, right, I do too, because it is. Um, the, uh, and last, I just, personal, personally, I just would like to thank, thank Stephanie Walton for her years of service at Dr. Cog. She's, she's a special individual, and I'm really going to miss her on the board, so we'll stay in touch. I will indeed. 
<laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. With that, we'll move ahead to item number eight, a motion to approve the consent agenda. Do I have a motion? Oh, I skipped over. I did. I'm sorry. I got a little, I, I did skip ahead. I apologize. Item number seven, public comment. And that was not intentional at all. Uh, up to 45 minutes is allocated now for public comment, and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. The chair requests there be no public comment on issues for which prior public hearings have occurred, and uh, consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. Mr. Kennedy, do we have any public comment? Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'll give it a second, but I do not see any hands raised online or in person. I don't see any public comments, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you very much. And now, item number eight, the move to approve the consent agenda. Do I have a motion? Okay, Director Flynn, and a second from, thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, nay. And any abstentions? Thank you very much. Uh, with that, we'll move ahead to our first action item, or first and only action item, tonight, which is to select a representative to the nominated committee. And we'll turn it over to Mr. Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. And uh, as you know, we've already had some conversation about the nominating committee tonight. We already have a couple of, uh, of our appointments from the Performance and Engagement Committee and the Finance and Budget Committee. Each year, this group gets together with two primary functions, the first being to select or recommend officers uh, for the executive committee to be your officers of the board. Um, the second is to uh, recommend uh, membership to the Performance and Engagement Committee and the Finance and Budget Committee. That will happen a little later in uh, 2024. So, um, so just so what we're doing tonight, so, so, um, so PENIA gets the one, Finance and Budget, uh, the board gets the select one at large. The, uh, the chair also gets to choose one. Um, the immediate past chair is also a member. Um, let me, that's it, right? Um, so tonight, so we're, we're really looking for volunteers who might be interested in serving on the nominating committee. I will m mention that if you're interested in serving on the nominating committee, you must have been on the board at least one year. And also, you are not eligible to be a, a, um, a member or a recommended member of the executive committee um, if you serve on the nominating committee, because you can't nominate yourself, basically. That was the intent. But just for this year, that doesn't mean in future years you couldn't be on the executive committee. I'll just leave it there. I said too much. With that, do we have any nominations? See, it's just the wheels are falling off. <laughs> Do we have any nominations? Director Flynn. I'd like to nominate uh, Director Spear. Director Spear, fantastic. Do you have any other nominations? Director Dyack. I'll nominate myself. Thank you, Director Dyack. Other nominations? Okay. Process. Nominations closed. Nominations closed. We'll do it. We'll do a secret ballot. What's that? Yeah. Yep. So we'll we'll do we'll do that. We'll we can continue on with it, and we'll get the ballots to you. And then once they're done, you just pass. Well, we'll come collect them. Because yeah, bye. I don't. Think. <laughs> I'm looking at Cam. This is when Melinda steps in and says, here are the ballots, <laughs> but we don't have them. So we're going to. <clears throat> yeah.
So with that, we are going to move ahead, and we will deal with the balloting here as we go along. Uh, Stand by. Uh, And thank you to the the nominees. Very much appreciated. With that, we'll move ahead to our first informational briefing, uh, item number 10, which is the 2023 Active Modes Crash Report. Ellen uh, (laughs) Aaron. Here I, I was afraid to mess up the last name, and I messed up the first name. Erin Pillory, thank you for being here, Transportation Planner uh, with Transportation Planning and Operations. Saw this presentation yesterday. It's good stuff. All right. Thank you. All right. <laughs> thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Aaron Villery. I'm the Senior Active Transportation Planner uh, and Transportation Planning and Operations here at Dr. Cog. Um, and I am happy to share with you all tonight um, our recently completed active modes crash report. So um, uh, the, the goal of this will just be to share some highlights and, and to sort of give you the, um, the overarching uh, takeaways from the, the crash report. Um, which I encourage you all to uh, read and and dive in in detail um, after this meeting. So what is the active modes crash report? Um, So we're using regional crash data uh, that we received from the Colorado Department of Revenue uh, that is then uh, curated by uh, Colorado uh, DOT and Dr. Cog. uh, And we're using this to analyze crash trends specifically during the time period. Uh, The majority of the report focuses on the time period 2015 to 2019. and uh, active mode users were specifically defining as people walking, including people using mobility devices, people bicycling. Um, and then uh, at, for this time period, uh, people riding scooters are included as pedestrians using uh, toy motorized vehicles. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about that time period and why that was chosen specifically. Um, so this is an update to a previously completed uh, bicycle and pedestrian crash report that was included as an appendix to the 2019 active transportation plan. And that crash report looked at the 2011 to 2015 time period. And we chose to look at 2015 to 2019 specifically because of what happened in 2020 for a couple reasons. First, we felt that um, looking at the pandemic, uh, uh, the first pandemic here and the early pandemic years uh, uh, alongside pre-pandemic time was not representative. Um, we felt that our sort of uh, role or, or advantage in, in looking at and getting this regional picture is to sort of use that five-year period immediately preceding the pandemic um, could give us an interesting window to understand some of the causes um, at a regional level um, resulting in, in active user crashes. Um, and uh, finally, the, the crash report form changed uh, in 2020, so it wouldn't have been an apples-to-apples apples comparison. So we do have some discussion of 2020 and 2021 at the end of the report, but uh, for the most part, we wanted to focus on that, that period of five years immediately preceding um, the pandemic. And so just to give you a, a, a quick um, snapshot of uh, what the last 10 years have looked like, Uh, I think we all are are aware of this, that this is a really pressing topic because specifically pedestrian fatal and severe injury crashes have been increasing over the past decade and and increasing pretty quickly. Um, We've seen in in the Denver region, we've seen a 42% increase from 2010 to 2019. Uh, bicycle uh, fatal and severe injury crashes, it's a more complicated picture. And then motor vehicle uh, crashes, we've also seen that increase over that same time period, but not as dramatic um, as the uh, pedestrian-involved crashes. Um, and specifically with the pedestrian-involved crashes, um, over the last decade, it's really gone from about 200 per year in, uh, in 2010 to about 285 in 2019 in the most recent years. So this is a pretty dramatic thing that's happening across the region. And so our goal is to really dive in and understand uh, what was feeling that. Um, sorry. I want to clarify, these are on CDOT roads only, or what is the scope again? This is the entire region. That's a great clarifying question. Um, so the, the data we do receive from the state, but this is on all, this is throughout the entire region on all uh, roadways. So it's not just CDOT facilities. So uh, thank it, you for that question. Yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to try to understand the scope. Yeah, it was a good clarification for sure. Um, 
And bicycle involved crashes, uh, as as mentioned, are a more complicated picture. Um, specifically that they were increasing until about 2014, and then we see them start to trend down a little bit. I want to caution looking at these because they're, they are smaller numbers, um, but we do see this downward trend, but a slight increase in the, the number of fatal bicycle-involved crashes um, going from 8 to 13. So um, th this may indicate that crashes are getting more severe involving bicycles, but it's something that uh, we would want to continue to monitor. Um, and just to, to sort of underline the, um, the salience of the topic, among all crashes in the region, uh, in the, the five-year period that we really focus on in the report, 3% uh, involved active users, uh, people walking or bicycling, but 22% involved uh, of fatal and severe injury crashes. Uh, involve people bicycling and walking. And this is specifically because people biking and walking do not have vehicle design to protect them, and so these crashes tend to be more catastrophic. Something that we observed among all crashes is that speed really amplifies, cr amplifies crash severity. So where posted speed uh, on a, a roadway exceeded 35 miles per hour, the crash was uh, involving pedestrians was twice as likely, more than twice as likely, to result in a fatality or severe injury as below 20 miles an hour. And so this is um, this is the, the sort of simple math of force that as speed increases, we really see um, the severity of crash uh, crashes go up. And similarly with bicycles uh, involved crashes, but to a, a less pronounced extent, um, uh, where posted speed exceeds uh, 35 miles per hour is 50% more likely to uh, result in fatality or severe injury. So the, the report is really organized um, around these two questions. We wanted to understand, you know, sort of taking this regional snapshot, we wanted to complement our uh, taking action on regional Vision Zero plan, um, which developed a high injury network. We wanted to complement the work that cities and towns and, uh, and counties are doing uh, to really understand some of the underlying factors and common causes among crashes. So we really looked at who was involved and where did the crashes occur? And so we sort of dove into these uh, socio-demographic factors um, and then also contextual factors of roadways and, and area types throughout the region. Um, and so that's kind of, I, I'm gonna go through just some very quick uh, nuggets um, to give you a, an overarching sense of what we found of some of the, the interesting things. Um, but then again, we'll encourage you to, to dig in a little more because there's uh, even more in the, in the full report. So this question of who is involved, and this is really the, um, trying to understand how uh, a person's identity or where they live in the, in the region um, or uh, how uh, different people use the roadway and, and the transportation system uh, might influence uh, their experience and, and their crash risk. And so we started by looking uh, at this question of, of sex designation um, and specifically a caveat that I want to make is that for this time period, uh, the state of Colorado driver's license didn't add the third X designation uh, to sex uh, until 2019. And so when we look at this, we really have male and female for this period of time. Um, but with that said, what we found is that men were really overrepresented among people involved in these active mode crashes. Um, we've seen uh, with, with surveys around bicycling and, and uh, sex and gender disparities in bicycling that men are more make up a higher percentage of the ridership of people bicycling on roadways. Um, and that was consistent with, with seeing about two thirds of people uh, involved in uh, fatal and severe injury crashes on bicycles uh, being men. But it was really surprising to us that about two thirds of the people involved in pedestrian crashes uh, were also men and, and, and something that I think merits um, a lot more consideration. We also wanted to look at age that sort of uh, um, as a popular, you know, children and older adults uh, because of their physiology uh, might be more likely to experience um, severe trauma uh, in the event of crashes. And we found that people over the age of 65 were about 52% more likely uh, than people in that sort of middle adult, young and middle adult age uh, group, 20 to 45 to have crashes when they were involved in crashes for those crashes to result in either fatality or severe injury. Um, so we did see that, uh, especially um, as age increased, um, severity increased. And then this is a very um, high level uh, sample of um, 
socio-demographic factors. And so the thing I, I kind of want to underline in this and uh, encourage you to dive in to the report for a little more information, but we, we looked at some, uh, some different socio-demographic indicators to understand how um, different factors that uh, we think of when we, when we talk about equity and, and crash risk uh, really influenced uh, likelihood to be involved in one of these crashes. And so we used uh, uh, USDOT's uh, Equitable Transportation Communities Indicators, which are a set of indicators using either or, either socioeconomic or demographic or um, uh, environmental burden factors, um, things like that, to understand um, social uh, risk. And so uh, we use these, and these uh, indices are um, created at the census tract level. And so what we want to understand is um, in census tracts that score higher on these indicators, um, are these communities more likely um, to uh, be involved in uh, fatal and severe injury crashes? And we found yes. Um, uh, so we, we broke it down by indicators, and I think the top line thing to underline here is that social vulnerability, environmental burden, and transportation cost burden, these were sort of three different indices that were developed, and these are three different maps. They're not necessarily three maps that are the same thing, um, that they are different areas uh, were in the, the top and lowest scoring quintiles. Um, and still, in, in each case, um, the, um, the top scoring quintiles were, were much more likely to have uh, fatal and severe injury uh, crashes. Um, so something to, to keep an eye on that, that those and equity indicators really tracked with crash risk. Um, and then finally, we, we did want to look at some of the like human contributing factors. Um, so we looked at drugs and alcohol. Um, these are reported in the, in the crash report form, uh, whether drugs or alcohol are suspected among people involved in the crashes. And we found that alcohol was suspected in um, about 20% 20 20 or one in five of the pedestrian fatal and severe injury crashes, um, which is, is a noteworthy and alarming uh, statistic. But it also wasn't uh, significantly higher than um, uh, just just motor vehicle uh, involved crashes, which was at about 17%. So um, something to keep an eye on um, and and uh, to merit further consideration. And so then uh, to talk about where did crashes occur, to sort of shift focus. And this is where we really wanted to get into the contextual factors. What's the land use like? What's the What are the roadway types and intersection types like where a lot of these crashes are occurring? What are the pre-crash movements? So what are people doing in the moments before a crash occurs to try to understand and, and, and even begin to um, predict a little? Um, what are some of the, the risky movements and, and places in our, our region that we might expect to see these uh, bicycling and walking crashes? And so we, we started by breaking it down by area type, and these area types were developed during the uh, regional Vision Zero plan, but uh, really looking at that, that top level of land use context and urban context, so uh, looking at urban, suburban, and rural um, areas throughout the region. Uh, so that was the first way that we broke it out because uh, people take different types of trips. You have different activities in each um, of the land use context. Um, and then we wanted to look at just what are the, where on the roadway did crashes commonly take place? And so these are looking at pedestrian crashes by area type. And you can see that across the entire region, um, more than half of pedestrian involved crashes happen at intersections. This is, um, this, this makes sense in that that's sort of the place where there's the most conflict and interaction among users. Um, but it really, um, as uh, context was more urbanized, you would see more of those intersection crashes. And as you get into more rural context, uh, more of those crashes happen in non-intersection locations. Um, and just to give you a little sample, um, we also found that 41% of the pedestrian intersection fatal and severe injury crashes involved left turns, and then another 38% involved broadside collisions. So really these two types of crashes, either left turning vehicles um, uh, colliding with, uh, uh, with pedestrians or uh, angle crashes, uh, really made up the majority of, of the pedestrian crashes throughout the, the region. Um, and something that came out a lot, and I, I just chose one area type, which is the urban uh, area pedestrian crashes, um, but this was a pretty common finding um, across uh, contexts, was 
that a third of the urban pedestrian crashes at intersections occurred at one intersection type, which was major arterial and local streets. And so you, you might think of these as, you know, wide um, uh, arterials with, with higher posted speed limits um, may or may not have signalized crossings where they cross local streets. Um, and that's really where we were seeing a lot of these crashes, and specifically those, those broadside crashes or those left turn involved crashes. So you might think of um, somebody crossing uh, without a signal or um, somebody, uh, uh, tr you know, making a left turn and trying to shoot a gap in traffic or things like that. And so there's really some specific movements and specific contexts where, where we saw a lot of these uh, active user crashes really um, concentrated. And then to move over to, to bicycles, just to give you again a, a quick sample, um, an even greater share of these were at intersection locations, and specifically in the urban area, we saw that three quarters of um, bicycle fatal and severe injury crashes occurred uh, at intersection locations. And so again, these are the, the nodes of conflict and interaction. And something that came out, the left turn crashes were um, really important uh, among bicycle crashes as well, but we also saw right turn crashes. And this is specific to the suburban context that a third of, of suburban bicycle crashes at intersections have involved right turn movements. And so you might think of this as the right turn hook or a right turn across uh, a bicycle travel path. Um, and again, pronounced as that major to minor and type. Finally, we wanted to dig into seasonality to understand how does time of day, how do some of these different um, contextual factors like lighting and changing light conditions um, and, and um, uh, peak hour travel uh, impact uh, crash conditions. We found that bicycle crashes are really concentrated to peak commute hours. While pedestrian crashes really increase in the afternoon and evening, um, and especially the, the late afternoon and early evening hours where you see those lighting conditions start to change during the day. Finally, we looked at seasons and, and interestingly, we found that while bicycle crashes seem to increase during the, the uh, summer and fall months where, where bicycle commuting is sort of most uh, appetizing, we'll say, because the weather's nice um, and it's, it's more bikeable, pedestrian crashes really increase in the late fall and winter. And that was uh, something that was, was sort of noteworthy that, again, as, those, as lighting conditions change, um, as you start to have, um, uh, you know, sort of different visibility conditions, um, you start to see those pedestrian crashes increase. And then finally, just to circle back to 2020 and 2021, um, we wanted to pin in uh, that uh, we, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll hear during the congestion uh, report uh, briefing that uh, what's going on with with vehicle mile uh, vehicle miles traveled around the region, and we found that as annual uh, vehicle miles traveled rebounded post 2020. Uh, specifically, pedestrian and motor vehicle involved crashes rebounded faster than vehicle traffic responded. So this is a, a problem that seems to be uh, getting more pronounced since the pandemic. Um, and bicycle crashes uh, rebounded as well, but not quite as fast, uh, especially as pedestrian crashes. Um, and so uh, that, that's just a, a very quick overview. Um, I'm uh, more than happy to, to answer questions. And I just wanted to flag that we, we really wanted to embark on this report to build a strong foundation for ourselves as, as we transition, we're doing the active transportation plan uh, in 2024. And we really wanted to have a really solid understanding of, of some of the safety issues for people bicycling and walking around the region. With that. First question from uh, Director Flynn. Uh, thank you, Aaron. Are, are these data available in the whole numbers in some report that we could see rather than percentages? Uh, yes, yeah, so the um, it depends. In, in the full report, some of the uh, different crash conditions we do try to represent as whole numbers, and then as, as we drill more into the data, we do tend to go more into percentages. Um, but uh, the crash data is also available at, at the Dr. Cog data portal as well. So it yeah, is okay. all so it's online. Eight. Thank you. Uh, Director Spear, and I've got I'm starting kind of a list here. So, and uh, Director Nermello will be after Director Spear. Thank you. Um, thanks for this presentation. Really appreciate seeing all these data. Um, one of the questions that I had was just around the reason for um, the impact of some of the socio-demographic factors on, um, on pedestrian and, and cyclist crashes. 
Is that because of a lack of infrastructure in these areas? I mean, what, what is it that leads to those big differences? There is an extent to which um, we try not to speculate too much, but um, where do I put this? Um, <laughs> they're among friends. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I, I think that's a big part of it. And, and I think one of the, the um, one of the most telling things, especially when you dig into like uh, the environmental burden uh, index, which looks at things like uh, prevalence of high use transportation facilities, you know, so how many, you know, are there um, a lot of major arterial roadways and, and which, which do tend to have, um, you know, uh, less buffering, uh, for instance, and, and more adjacency to, to fast-moving traffic, um, those certainly increase. Uh, you know, the, the prevalence of those uh, facilities that increase that are associated with risk certainly increase in neighborhoods that score lower um, on those indices and on Dr. Cog's equity index as well. So, um, without being too speculative, that there's there's definitely you know the indices measure essentially uh, in, in pretty good ways, quality of the infrastructure, how much of a burden is it to travel, you know, how much does it cost, and those things certainly um, scale alongside crash risk, so. Um. Yeah, thank you. Um, this just it makes me wonder about, as we're um, thinking about our next TIP process in a few years, is safety something we can start thinking about as a criteria uh, for evaluating those um, applications? Yeah, I kind of had a similar question. I'm just trying to understand the, the data that we have. Does it give us any information about what facilities are on the road, where these accidents happen, um, or just road speeds or anything like that so we can get a better understanding? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, there, uh, so the, the way that I would frame it is, is we have some good data within the crash reports themselves, which is, you know, things about, like, what's the posted speed on the roadway, um, where on the roadway were people, um, and when you're, you know, when, when we're trying to conduct, like, a more uh, high-level analysis, you start to lose some of that granularity about specific crashes. But uh, certainly the, the things that we found um, for uh, bicycle infrastructure didn't have a strong association, for instance, with. Uh, with some of the crashes, um, so it's, um, uh, it, and, and I think part of that is just because of how rapidly bike infrastructure has changed in the region, so it's, it's kind of hard to track some of these infrastructural pieces. Uh, we do have some information about, you know, like sidewalk coverage and, and things. Certainly, uh, like I can give you a good example, in the rural areas where you have lower sidewalk coverage, the types of crashes you see are tend to be same direction travel and things like that. So those are certainly um, related to, to facility coverage, but um, you sacrifice a little bit of that granularity when you do the higher level analysis, um, I guess is my short answer to that. Um, but uh, it, it certainly plays a role, having infrastructure to use and in, in a separate facility. Chairman, if I may, just, just to add to that, I think we have to keep in mind, um, you know, the time period of this data, too. So the latest is 2018? So this, this report really uh, runs uh, 2015 through 2019. Through 2019. So, uh, you know, there's been a tremendous amount of infrastructure improvement um, in, in the bicycle arena since then. So we'll be curious to see over, you know, the next several years if that has a dramatic effect on, on, uh, on crashes for sure. But we're also seeing, you know, an influx of, of new riders, right? So it'll be interesting to see how that all plays out. But as we all know, if they don't, people don't feel safe on safe taking a mode of transportation, they ain't going to do it. So I think it's imperative for all of us to give some thought to that. Uh, just so you know who's in the queue, uh, Levy, Walton, uh, Winshaw, Nicholas Williams, uh, Director Hausman, uh, Larry Vedham, and uh, Director uh, uh, Derecio. So that's where we are right now. Director Levy. 
There we go. Uh, page 38, where you have the bicycle intersection types, and you've got, um, it, and it deals with right turn uh, crashes with bikes. I don't know if this was just the particular drawing you chose or whether you were intending to show that these involve by, uh, cars that are making right turns and bikes that are coming from the left. Was that intended to just represent that kind of um, crash? Uh, and the reason I ask is I, I think there's a lot of what happens, which is bikes going straight and a car making a right turn into the bike. And I just didn't know whether that was intentional, that this was the only configuration. No, that's a that's a great point. That so some of the the crash diagrams that we show um, are are illustrative examples, um, uh, and so that's that's one type of crash is uh, that right turn across a straight travel path. But that could all that right turn figure does also include the right hook that you're describing, which is bicycle traveling straight and a vehicle turns. Uh, uh, thanks for that clarification. I am only just now starting to read about a lot of concern about the right on red. And so now I'm attuned to that. I'm just I'm just thinking about this in that context. Dr. Walton. I was wondering if there is um, any e-bike data that is either incorporated in this or if at any point it might be separated. Yeah, um, so for this, uh, one of the reasons that um, we're excited about the updated crash form that uh, debuted in 2020 is, is it starts to collect more of that granular vehicle data. This one, unfortunately, doesn't have um, that level of granularity, so we assume that people bicycling might include some electric assist bikes. But the thing that's really happened, you know, I would say in the last three years is, is uh, certainly a much higher prevalence of those vehicles on the road. So this report for that primary time period doesn't disaggregate for uh, e-bike versus acoustic bike, but um, in, in sort of the next period of time, looking 2020 forward, we in, and hope to have much more granular data about that. Director Shaw from Lone Tree. Thank you so much. I had a thought about the um, pedestrian uh, figures being up during the winter months and thought that perhaps it had to do with snow or ice on the walkways that drove the pedestrians to the roads to walk. Um, so another thought in addition to the uh, brightness, the, the lighting. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. Um, it was something that we, that we looked at and uh, the crash reports actually do collect information about conditions on roadway. Um, and interestingly, uh, I believe it's in the report, but um, icy conditions were uh, didn't pop as a uh, during those winter months as a particularly common crash type. It was, it was very small that a lot of the roadways were cleared in these conditions. So it was actually kind of an interesting thing because you kind of would expect that, right? Like. Um, yeah, ice on, on roads would make things a little more treacherous. Um, so it's it was interesting that that didn't come out. Thank you. Mr. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Excellent report. The, you had mentioned the scooters, and, and I think you kind of touched on a little bit with, with Director Walton's comment on there. How did you, what was the source of data for that? We've really found it difficult to parse out crash data, injury data when it comes to scooters. So what, what, what source did you all use for that? Uh, the the source we have is the crash report that's filed um, by the by the officer when um, after the crash occurs and so um, the you know in these in this case it was it's up to the reporting officer to to code the crash uh, participant as uh, either pedestrian uh, using a toy motorized vehicle in that case um, versus you know a bicycle and 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 so you do get into a little bit of judgment. Um, and again, that's one of those things that, um, I mean, the scooter use is really like it's a story that since like 2019 um, has really just, just exploded. And, and so um, we look forward to, to you know, the, the next vintage of this report to having much better data about um, both crashes. Great. Same. Thank you. Mr. Hazen. Disappointed. I'm disappointed that the data is 2019. Why is there a lag in data 
for 2021 and 22. Absolutely. So, oh, well, I want to have another question. So, I, but go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, I can quickly get into sort of the process. So, um, uh, I believe by charter, um, the data goes, uh, the crash data that's uh, collected by uh, all jurisdictions goes to the Colorado State Department of Revenue. Um, they go through a process of, of cleaning and coding, then they hand it to the, the State Department of Transportation, and then it comes to us. And, and so there's, there's sort of all these quality control processes to make sure that the data is coded and um, uh, accurate um, and uh, usable for analysis. And so uh, 2021 data, we are um, uh, actually in the process of, of, I believe, finishing that uh, that QC right now. And so um, there is a lag. It's, you know, we're, we're at the end of 2023, and, and I definitely want to own and acknowledge that, that it's, uh, it's quite a bit behind um, when the data, you know, when the crash has actually happened. So I think that, you know, certainly some of the parameters will probably hold true. Uh, my wife noted, tells me often that, that uh, women are more careful than men. And I think there's probably a basis here, but I don't see any data about how many uh, bicycles are being used. How, how much are we talking about? Sorry, about, about total ridership? Well, bicycles are increasing, but I don't see how many men or how many women are, are using bicycles. Are more men using bicycles than women? Or? Yeah, I see. Um, so uh, the, the sort of best source that we have on this is, is some regional survey data. Um, that, that we cite in the report, and we believe that uh, it's about 70% uh, of bicycle riders are men, um, and that's based on, on regional survey data, and that tracks pretty closely with national uh, data, so, so men are pretty overrepresented among bicycle riders. Well, they seem to be overrepresented in the accident rates you're showing as well, so it would be a reason, would be that there are more men uh, riding Absolutely. than women. Uh, I have other questions, but I'm sure other one else do too, so I'll get back in line. Thank you, Director Bidham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, at the very beginning of your comments, uh, did, did I understand you correctly that uh, scooters are included in p pedestrian numbers? Yes. Okay. So I'm on the uh, page that's ac active mode crash trends. So in the lingo of a stock trader, um, bicycle crashes are in a steep decline. Um, motorized vehicles are in a, a, a range bound, they're just going sideways, and pedestrian incidents are going through the roof. So uh, when I was about uh, in my early 20s, I actually raced cars, and my family was trying to impress upon me how incredibly dangerous w the things that I was doing. And of course, I blew them off because I was invincible. So when I come downtown and I see people on these scooters, I mean, they have the same attitude that I had when I was 20 years old because I see uh, young people uh, blowing through uh, red lights. I saw a young woman do a face plant about uh, a month ago, uh, particularly at night. The uh, rear view light on these things is about as bright as the hot end of a cigar. Okay, and so... As, as long as uh, people are, are actively on scooters, I, I'm not optimistic about where the uh, pedestrian number is going to go. And I, 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 don't, I don't frankly see anything can be done about it. Thank you. Dr. Odoricio. Thank you. I, I'm looking through the report, and I have to admit I, I relied more heavily on the PowerPoint than the report. Now I'm going into the report saying, where, where are the recommendations on what we need to do for design and policy? Yeah, um, it, it, it was, uh, that's a great question. Um, and it was uh, pretty intentional with this report. We actually didn't want to make recommendations. Sure. Um, and the reason for that is we really just wanted to build that, that strong foundation for the active transportation plan uh, that will be kicking off next year. Um, and so the thing to that is, is sort of having this information in hand, we're really excited to to sort of take that next step and to really work with our stakeholders and, and the public and, and this body to develop those recommendations. So um, the report is, is really geared towards just 
building that strong analytical foundation to understand what's going on. And I think that's interesting, and I appreciate that, actually, because I'm sure everyone has different opinions on how to interpret the data, and et cetera. But I'll be looking at if there are supplemental or other types of information that we could get. I know all of our engineering folks within our respective governments all have ideas and standards and such. And you know, there's those folks who say roundabouts are good and some that say they're evil and then left turns and do we the purpose of a median versus not a median. And uh, I can tell you that even within my, our own neighborhoods, we get inconsistent explanations from different members of our own staff to our community that makes it hard for me to, to answer. So I'm always just looking for more information on how I can explain, well, why did we do it this way? And why are we not doing it these other ways? And so look forward to that information. I think this is fascinating. You guys did a great job. Thank you very much. Just uh, to update on the queue, we'll go to Director Shaw from Superior next, and then Director Hazeman and Director Nirmela uh, with a, a second question. If there's anybody that has not had a chance to ask a question, we'll deal with those first, and then we'll wrap up here fairly soon. Director Shaw. Great. Thank you. Um, Aaron, I really appreciate this, and it's pr really timely. The town superior, we're trying to go through a road diet, and you'd think we're shutting down the roads, making everybody walk. But um, that being said, <laughs> a couple questions on the data. Um, and I, I looked through the big report. I didn't see it. Is there, and I really appreciate the correlation data, but did you guys break it down to day of the week? Um, my speculation is certain days of the week are probably much worse than others. And as we think about enforcement, enrolling you know, our, our um, police force through, there might be certain days of the week that it's more beneficial to do that. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and I didn't get to go into it in the presentation, but uh, uh, we did look at that in, in the report. Um, and I'm going to have to summarize from memory a little bit. So um, <laughs> um, uh, what, what we saw is pretty consistent or pretty consistent with the time of day that um, bicycle involved crashes were more concentrated to happening during traditional hours, you know, and so Monday through Friday. Um, and then similarly, the pedestrian crashes um, were more focused on those nighttime hours, but pedestrian trips tend to, you know, um, we saw a, I would say, bigger increase relative to the end of the week. You know, so Thursday to, to Saturday, especially um, uh, with pedestrian crashes. Um, so it's there, that seasonality or that sort of temporality uh, was really consistent. All right, thank you. Director Hazeman. In uh, Golden, we've done a pedestrian bike study, and one of the things I heard at Dr. Cog was 20 is plenty. And we have implemented that. We took it back, and thank you, Dr. Cog. Uh, but you said you were reluctant to make recommendations, and we're talking about saving lives. Uh, who does make recommendations for how to save lives for pedestrians and bicyclists? Absolutely. Um, so I, if, if, if I can rephrase, we're excited to make recommendations and we want to go through a little more process before we do that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so we, the, the purpose of this report wasn't to make recommendations, but it's sort of building up to the next thing. So, Thank you. Great. Uh, Dr. Shosey, and then we'll wrap up with Director Nirmala. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm, one, I'm curious to understand, too, with the, the bicycle crash, is there a way to understand, and I know that you've said a couple of times, it's hard to get in the granular, but the difference between folks who have, uh, like, this is their mode of transportation, their commuters on their bicycles, versus folks who are um, more recreational cyclists, or like myself, cycling around their neighborhood. Yeah, yeah, and, and again, I would have to get a little speculative because, like, um, the crash report data, just, you know, doesn't have that level of granularity. But to sort of follow the thread that, you know, bicycle-involved uh, crashes were really happening during those commute hours, and you know, um, who are commuting by bicycle are probably doing that multiple days, um, and so there's a, there's a real difference. But um, um, in those populations, but just something that was sort of interesting, and to kind of circle back to, I think, a point that was made earlier, um, which is, you know, you, you have that period of time where uh, bicycle crashes look like they're going down, you know, from 2014 to 2019, and we don't believe that ridership was decreasing during that time. Sort of think the opposite, you know, and, and so you start to have more of these discretionary riders or recreational riders or things like that um, who might be transitioning into bicycling more and more, and during that time period, we didn't 
see a, an increase in crashes, you know. And so um, the other thing that happened during that time period, of course, was the implementation of a lot of infrastructure. And so we don't have the information about um, which riders are involved in which crashes because we don't have the narratives for these, uh, these crashes. But um, I think there's a lot of complexity in there. And finally on this topic, Director Nirmala. Just a, a, my planner hat. So as you're going into your plan for next year, um, one, I'd just be interested in making sure you have more up-to-date crash data. You know, obviously we were just talking talking earlier about um, you know the change that we've seen over the past four years, and that that's not going to be ready or available for when you're going into your plan to make recommendations. I would also um, so that's just, you know, I don't know how you're going to resolve that, but potentially, you know, there are a lot of communities that have transportation master plans, trans transportation mobility plans, and we've, in, as communities, synthesized crash data um, specific to our uh, communities and, and cities, and so that could serve as case studies, particularly for, you know, the urban, suburban, rural, and if you you know, I'm sure we'd all be happy to share that kind of information so that you could have even more detail than what you have in these um, crash reports. No, I, I, um, I think that would be great, and, and we look forward to having a lot of engagement with member governments as we help these recommendations. Executive Director Rex. Great, thank you, sir, very much. Um, Director Normella, yes, we would love that data. Um, Director Hazeman raised the issue first with regards to the, you know, the age of the, the, the crash data that we do have. Um, it is frustrating for us. I know, I'm sure Darius would agree that the, the process that we currently have in place and that getting this crash data out the door is not the most efficient. And, and as a result, we've actually, we have a planner on staff through a grant that was provided in part through CDOT, I believe, right, Ron? Yeah, that, um, uh, you know, that his sole purpose is to look at this process and provide hopefully more efficiency in getting more and better and more recent data. Because, I mean, it, it's, it is, I mean, it's hard to have a conversation, like, you know, when you're talking about 2019 data, I mean, Gee whiz, I mean, it's a whole pandemic between then and now, right? And we do know there's been a tremendous amount of bicycle infrastructure that's been put in place, most notably, you know, protected uh, facilities. So anyway, well, stay tuned on that. You'll, you'll be getting a report on that sometime soon. Aaron, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. We are going to double back to election information. So if anybody has a breaking news sounder, we can do that. Uh, here's, here's where we are with the, uh, the, the voting for the representatives to the nominating committee. We have to have a vote from the board. Okay? <laughs> we have two nominees. I can appoint someone. So what I'm recommending is I will make my appointment first. We will then have one candidate, and the board can vote by acclamation as opposed to doing the secret ballot and all that stuff. Any objection to that? <laughs> With that said, the, the chair appoints John Dyack from the town of Parker, and so Nicole Spears is up for election, and I would ask for there to be a motion to elect her unanimously. So moved. So, so moved. Any seconds? Second. Any objections? All in favor, aye. Aye. Any opposed, nay. There you go. We have uh, people on the nominating committee. Thank you both, and thank you for, for letting us wait till we kind of work through some of those issues. With that said, we'll move on to item number 11, the 2022 annual report on roadway, tra roadway traffic congestion. Robert Spots, manager, and Max Monk, assistant transportation planner with transportation planning and operations. The floor is yours. All right, good evening. Uh, hi, I'm Robert Spots. I manage the mobility analytics program here at Dr. Cog. Um, 
we are behind here as well. Only 11 months, though, not three years. We're still talking about 2022. Um, again, one of those things, again, the data rolls in, we do the report. Here we are. Uh, but uh, 2022 does seem kind of like a long time ago. Uh, to remind you, uh, Dr. Cog did not formally go back to the office until April 1st of 2022. We were wearing masks for most of 2022 in the office. So we were still like really like in, in in dealing with the pandemic pretty significantly for most of this year. So that certainly affected people's travel. However, um, I'm adding to my sample size from yesterday, but curious how many of you today still travel differently than you did before the pandemic by a show of hands. So some folks are back to the way it was. How about the way you get goods and services or food delivered to your home? Are you doing more of that now than in 2019, show of hands? More deliveries? More deliveries, more deliveries. Yeah, it was getting more things delivered to your home. Yeah, lots of folks. So. Absolutely. Amazon. And last question, um, do you feel like congestion is getting back to or at the level it was in 2019 yet? By show of hands. Look at that, interesting stuff. Uh, cool, well, um, Max Monk is uh, relatively new for our, to our staff. He's gonna be presenting to you all for the first time. I'm very excited to turn it over to him. He did a great job yesterday and great presentation to you about 2022 and congestion. Thank you, Robert. Is this working? Okay, there we go. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the board. My name is Max Monk, as Robert introduced me, and I am here to present on the 2022 annual report on congestion for our region. So this report is part of a congestion management process, or a CMP. Uh, this, this process is federally required through the U.S. Department of Transportation to monitor the evolution of congestion in our region. Um, components of Dr. Cog's process include a database of roadway attributes, so things like how many lanes exist on a facility, how many signals, um, so on and so forth, traffic counts, so how much volume is on a facility, and then crash incidents and multimodal data metrics. Um, we also do take, um, excuse me, no, we take those and, and compile it into the annual report on congestion, and we're, we're here to present on our findings for 2022 tonight. So to provide an overview of what we're going to present, we're going to go through our uh, the trends and observations that we saw, so things like vehicle miles traveled, transit ridership, and shared micromobility usage. Um, we'll talk about how we expect congestion to look in 2050 should the dynamics we observed last year continue into the future. And then um, every year we do try to add a bit of value to this report. Uh, you know, it's a federally required process, but we want it to, to you know, tell a story if it can. So um, we, we took a look at how dynamics are shifting on historic commute corridors following the pandemic. And then we're, we're trying something new. We wanted to, to take a look outwards and see what's happening in the rest of the nation in the realm of congestion and um, help connect you, you all to those, those stories and information. So to, to start with vehicle miles traveled, or VMT. Uh, VMT represents the total mileage traveled on all of our roadways in the region on a given day. So this is a daily metric. Um, the chart you see on screen depicts VMT from 2000 to 2022. Um, in general, it's, it's pretty steadily increased and has aligned with population growth, um, but there, there are a couple of points where it's stagnated or, or declined, um, notably during the, the recession period, um, and it, it took a stark decline by about 15% um, between 2020, or excuse me, 2019 and 2020 um, when the pandemic began. It starkly increased between 2020 and 2020. 2021, um, but only increased by about 1% um, between 2021 and 2022. So um, we're, we're actually still below pre-pandemic levels um, in terms of VMT. Um, so um, yeah, the, we're going to have to continue monitoring this, and it, it's, a, it's a bit tough to predict when we will reach uh, pre-pandemic levels for VMT. We do also uh, consider VMT per capita. So looking at VMT as it relates to our region's population, uh, it follows a lot of the same dynamics and trends um, and is also still below pre-pandemic levels. Um, we do have a target in our MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan for VMT per capita at right around 23. Um, we are still above that and, um, you know, we did, it, we did see a lot of negative impacts related to the pandemic, but um, we're, we're hopeful to leverage, you know, the impacts that we, we did see on our, our transportation system and maybe, you know, move the needle towards our target, again, that is in our, our plan. 
So that was VMT. We'll shift to, to transit ridership. Um, th this chart will be a bit different, and it, it looks a little bit more recently, um, only going back to, to 2019. Um, this, this chart represents average daily ridership by month um, and uses 2019 as a baseline. That's the line that you see in blue. Uh, the line you see in orange represents a difference in, uh, from that baseline. So you'll see a, a stark decrease in uh, March and April of 2020, where, where the pandemic began. And it's sort of ebbed and flowed um, since then, generally increasing, but, but, but struggling a, a bit more compared to, to that VMT metric. Um, this is due to, to a decrease in uh, service levels, uh, increase in telework, and, you know, a, a lot of populations are still concerned about, um, you know, exposure to the virus. So, you know, there, there are a lot of factors that are, that are influencing uh, what we're observing here. In 2022, we did a, have uh, the pilot of Zero Fare for Better Air uh, through the state of Colorado. This made transit free for that high ozone month um, here in the region, and it, it did see our, our highest point of post-pandemic ridership. Um, and we do notably have uh, additional data available into 2023, um, and it does look like ridership is continuing to increase, but uh, we wanted to keep a focus on 2022, um, given the, the number of modes that we're, we're comparing today. So next, we'll, we'll talk about shared micromobility. Um, shared micromobility refers to uh, devices that, that can be used by community members that are smaller than an automobile. So things like scooters, bikes, uh, these can have stations or be dockless. I'm sure everyone has, has an idea in their mind of, of what these look like, especially um, a lot of them are present in urban centers. Um, but, but this mode's a bit different than both uh, transit and VMT in that it has seen a, a pretty steady increase um, from prior to the pandemic on. Uh, in fact, it, it, it's tripled. Uh, the, the chart represents average number of micromobility trips per day, um, and, and those have tripled into 2022. So we're excited to see that this mode is growing. Um, we acknowledge it's not a silver bullet for congestion by any means, um, but it, it's an additional choice for people, especially with shorter trips, and um, it, it helps address that you know, first mile, last mile barrier often borne by transit. Um, so um, we're, yeah, we'll continue to monitor this moving forward. So covered a lot on a bunch of different modes. Um, I want to shift our focus back to, to automobile travel, uh, particularly on our freeways. So um, we were really curious about uh, the highest magnitude of congestion in our region, and we recognize that a lot of travel occurs on our freeways, and we wanted to see, you know, are there specific corridors where um, congestion is more severe uh, compared to the rest of the, uh, the region? Um, the two corridors you see on screen um, probably won't surprise you. They tell an interesting story. Um, I-25 from I-70 to University and I-270 in its entirety. Uh, these corridors represent 3% of our freeway network um, in terms of length. Um, but despite this, they represent uh, about 22% of the delay on our freeways. So what this means, delay represents, um, you know, a noticeable slowdown, stop and go traffic where um, you, you are, are delayed from reaching your destination in a more um, predictable time period. So another way to look at this is that one out of every five minutes of delay on our, our freeway network occurs on one of these two corridors. So we found that to, to be really interesting and, and wanted to share that here. I'm going to pause, take a breath. <laughs> um, so that, that was a big look at what we saw in 2022. And now we want to talk about, you know, if the dynamics that we did observe continue into the future, um, what, what will congestion look like in 2050? Um, it's important to note, you know, it's tough to predict the, the future sometimes. Who saw the pandemic coming? Um, this is a far ways away, and it, it represents a, a possible future, right? So take this with a grain of salt. Um, but, but, you know, if those dynamics continue, this is what we can expect. Uh, vehicle miles traveled could be expected to grow, or excuse me, vehicle miles traveled per capita could be expected to grow to 27 miles per day. So that's an increase from, from where we were at in 2022, and um, it is, it's still well above our goal of 23 miles per day in our regional transportation plan. Um, every year we do try to calculate a, an, an estimated cost of congestion based upon um, people's time spent in traffic instead of um, in more productive means or from fuel spent idling. And we really use this to, to compare how this, this sort of 
uh, burden of congestion borne by a region changes over time. It's not a precise, um, each household pays this many dollars per, per year, but um, it just, it, it allows us to, to look into the future. And um, we can expect the, the cost or that burden of congestion to increase by about 67% between last year and 2050. Um, for members that have been part of this committee or other committees for, for some time, this, this graphic on screen probably looks familiar, um, but it does remain true. Uh, congestion at 2 p.m. in 2050 will look and feel a lot like uh, congestion did at 5 p.m. in 2022. And what this really means is um, congestion is it's, it's looking like it's going to shift temporally, right? Um, so that that afternoon, evening, rush hour period will shift to an earlier point in the day um, should those, those dynamics we observed continue on. Now to provide some, some spatial context for both 2022 and um, what we could expect in 2050, uh, the red lines you, you see on screen represent um, corridors that we identified in 22, and um, tw the orange lines represent corridors, um, additional corridors rather, that we can expect to be um, congested in 2050. So um, in terms of the, the ones we, we have observed, uh, I'm sure that a lot of them are, are pretty predictable and expected, a lot of I-25, I-270, I-225, and a lot of core arterials, Federal, uh, Sheridan, Wadsworth, and so on. Um, but we're, we're expecting um, more freeways and more arterials alike to, to become congested by 2050. I have a question. Yes. I, I don't see any green lines on where it's going to get better. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so, yeah, we, we, are, we didn't include on the map anywhere we're expecting things to improve. And um, I, I will say we did see between 2021 and 2022 some of the congestion um, shift from arterials onto um, our freeways. So um, what that shows us is that, uh, you know, some of these corridors and at least segments are improving a little bit, but, you know, that, that can change depending on the next year of data as well. So as I mentioned, every year we try to undertake a special topic analysis, add some value to this, this process, and, um, you know, we in our program understand the pandemic continues to influence travel behavior. Um, Telework became a public health necessity during the pandemic. Uh, people were urged and at times required to stay home. Um, and, you know, telework continues to, to be frequent and prevalent um, following that influence. And this is especially the case for office commuters. So this, this led us to the question, um, have, have dynamics on these historic office commute corridors shifted? Are we seeing changes in the data? Um, are, are people traveling at different times of day? Uh, so on and so forth. So we wanted to, to look into this question by examining travel time data. So how long it takes to, on average, to traverse a corridor from end to end. And then as well as traffic volume data. So how, how many trips are being taken on a facility in a given day? Um, we, we collected these data prior to the pandemic and in 2022. We wanted to, to keep this focus on our freeway system. Um, a lot of commuting does, does touch our freeways at, at one point or another. And we, we looked at a number to, of corridors based on a few key destinations in the region and wanted to hone in on the, the few, like three that we, we thought told the most interesting story. So uh, the orange line you see on screen represents uh, Lakewood to downtown Denver along US 6. The purple line represents Highlands Ranch to the Denver Tech Center. And then the green line represents Mid Aurora to the Denver International Airport. To start with that first corridor from Lakewood to Denver, uh, we'll start with that first variable to travel time. Um, in 2019, it would take you an average of 11 minutes to, to travel that corridor from end to end. Um, but in 2022, that was about 14% down at nine minutes as an average. So um, two minutes might not feel like a lot, but that's multiplied across every vehicle on that facility. Um, so that, that savings is, is pretty, pretty sizable, um, multiplied against uh, tens of thousands of vehicles. Uh, this does provide benefits for air quality um, and uh, for, for greenhouse gas emissions as well as traffic's able to, to move a little bit um, more, more fluidly and, and flow well. Yes. Ooh, the western part, I believe, was Union Boulevard. Absolutely. Um, so, so yeah, that's that first variable, uh, travel time. The second variable we looked at was volume. And uh, considering all time periods, 2022 saw about the same level of traffic as in 2019. So the, the same number of trips are being taken. Um, however, looking specifically at, um, you know, 
temporally over day of week, uh, we're seeing about 17% fewer vehicles during that AM peak. So there are fewer people um, on this corridor in the morning, um, but we're still seeing a, a decrease in travel time. So, so what this shows us is that you know telecommuting and flexible schedules are, are probably a pretty key part of um, explaining the, the decrease in that travel time. The second corridor is Mid Aurora to the Denver International Airport. Uh, starting with travel time, we saw an average of 25 minutes end to end um, in 2019, and it was the same in 2022, so no change there. Um, in terms of volume, uh, during the busier travel months um, in 2022, we saw higher traffic levels um, and, and about the same at, at a lot of other points. So by all accounts, we, we feel that this corridor is back, right? Um, we were seeing uh, Denver International Airport had a record number of passengers in 2022. It was identified as the third busiest airport in the world. Um, we saw a 20% increase in jobs and a 6% increase in housing, and we're, we're, we're expecting that to continue to increase into the future. So that is an interesting corridor we wanted to show. And, oh, and the other piece I wanted to mention was that we acknowledge that this corridor um, is probably not going to, to see much telecommuting. We wanted to, to frame sort of, you know, what, 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 what new is happening with the airport and how does that compare against our, um, our telecommuting corridors or, or ones we expect to be Im impacted by telecommuting. And then lastly is Highlands Ranch to the Denver Tech Center. Um, this one is both similar to that Lakewood corridor and uh, a bit different at the same time. Um, in 2019, it took an average of 23 minutes to travel this corridor from end to end, and it saw a similar increase, uh, or excuse me, decrease by about 13% in uh, travel time and delay. Um, however, where it, it differs is um, it saw a few, less volume on, on this facility, so there are fewer trips being taken, and we, we feel that some combination of telework and the completion of the C-470 managed lane, um, which opened up during this period, would explain this shift. All right. Sorry, I'm throwing a lot at you guys. Uh, we're, all, we're almost there. Uh, so the, the last, last bit we wanted to touch on, um, we wanted to look outwards and, and provide some updates in, in what the rest of the nation is doing in the realm of congestion. Um, so to, to highlight a, a couple of key examples, um, there's a lot of discussion uh, regarding the communication between smartphones and traffic signals in Dallas, Texas, and then the production of a digital twin allowing um, lie, a live look at traffic flow in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, to start with that Dallas, Texas example, um, you know, smartphones have be become very ingrained in, in our lives, right? And this, this remains true in terms of navigation. Many of us um, plug, plug destinations into our phone, and it shows the, the best route to get there. And it, it also shows where it expects slowdowns to occur um, because, you know, there are people with devices um, experiencing those delays. In other words, smartphones network with each other. They know where congestion exists. And, and Dallas is considering upgrading their traffic signals to, to tap into this network and uh, give their, their planners, engineers, um, some, some live data and, and then make for more efficient traffic management. In Chattanooga, um, in partnership with the National Renewable Energy Lab and the Department of Energy, um, and through machine learning and real-time data, they created a micro-model mirroring Chattanooga traffic conditions with precision and, um, and live, which is pretty unprecedented in the industry. Um, this is known as a digital twin, which enabled uh, planners to better understand underlying causes of congestion and pinpoint specific areas of improvement. Um, and so our, our understanding, um, once this tool was used, um, some measures were employed and researchers observed a 32% reduction in delay and a 16% reduction in fuel spent idling. So this is, this is an exciting um, development and uh, NREL and the DOE note that they're, they're hoping to scale this up and bring it to more municipalities, more regions. So this is something we'll certainly be keeping tabs on moving forward. All right, so I, I threw a lot at you guys and um, you know, 2050, that, again, is only a possible future, right? We, we hold a lot of power here to, to shift that paradigm. And I just want to highlight, you know, some of the, the great work that we're doing. Um, we have Denver Region ITS uh, that, that connects um, travelers with, with pertinent information re relating to, to crashes and, and works a, a lot with our, our signal timing. Um, we here at Dr. Cog, in partnership with the state, are um, working on a new household travel survey that will connect us with new information, more, more to-date data, um, which will, will um, be very useful. 
We're doing transportation demand management. We have way to go. Um, that's helping shift single occupancy vehicle trips into multimodal trips, getting vehicles off of the road. And here at Dr. Cog and across mem many of our member agencies, we have uh, a lot of projects that are, are helping to facilitate more travel choices to, to give people opportunity to avoid those worst impacts of congestion. So with that, I'm, I'm happy to take any comments, questions, and yeah, thank you so much for having me. RTC yesterday, we told you what a good job you did on the, pro the program. Yet again, very good job. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you. We look forward to having more of those. Uh, Director Flynn. Thank you. Uh, Max, just real quick for clarification. I think I understand it, but I want to make sure I'm correct. On slide six, where you talked about VMT, uh, there was a sharp drop in like 2000 for the per capita. Right yes. Uh, does that represent where you actually started keeping per capita, or was there some other reason for that? No, no. So we, we do track per capita in 2000. It steadily grow, grew with, um, with, v, with, excuse me, population increases. But during the, the Great Recession, we, we surmise, you know, people, especially due to economic concerns, instead of those right. like the pandemic, uh, just drove less. Um, they, they didn't uh, want to spend as much money on, on fuel, and they chose other modes to travel. Thank you. That looks like it occurred a little bit before the, the Great Crash, but uh, thank you. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. That's, I see what uh, you're talking about. That's not real understandable to yeah. me. Uh, you know, at, in our 2007 report, we really focused on that. It was really interesting. It was, it was almost like this precursor that we uh -huh. planned out before the Great Recession. Similarly, oddly, in 2019, right before the pandemic, we also had a 0% growth in impact. So it's kind of before these big change things happened, we had level VMT. It was really interesting. For I, I, okay. And then the second question on uh, the uh, per capita, that per driver or per total population? This is per total population. So, like, if I had two people and three people in my household, two of whom stayed home, my wife's retired, she don't go anywhere, uh, at is that would average those into the equation also it's actually worse per driver per vehicle well per trip uh, there's the other way too though where it's we're dividing by population but there's a lot of folks that are coming in from out of the region going to denver trips going through i-70 that don't even stop here right big freight so all commercial vehicles and trips are all pit taken so it's not saying that you and your family drive 22 miles an hour or 22 miles a day it's like that number is getting both boosted by all those other trips that are happening both commercial and passenger all right vehicles. thank you thanks for the clarification Director Levy. Thanks. I, you know, I think one of the things we've been curious about with micro mobility and the scooters, notwithstanding the hazard, um, is whether that is actually having a demonstrable effect on BMT. And I was just wondering whether you, you're seeing that in the data at all, or whether there's any way to determine it. And I was, you know, just looking at how this three times increase in uh, users or ridership of micromobility then maps onto the VMT, you know, it hasn't increased quite as at steep a rate as we might have thought. So I was just wondering what your thoughts might be on that. Yeah, Mr. Chair and, and Director, that that's a, an interesting question. It's you know, it's a little hard to, to look into, right? Um, a lot of these micromobility trips are shorter distance, whereas a lot of vehicle trips are, are tend to be further. Um, and it's it's also hard to gauge where a micromobility trip was linked with a transit trip, for example. Um, so the, the data, that especially that we have access to, um, didn't allow for, for us to, to look at that too closely. Um, but yeah, Robert, would you like to add anything? I, I'm trying to recall, I think it was a downtown Denver partnership study that kind of did survey that. I think it was about a, one third of those trips were replacing what would have been a single occupancy vehicle trip. So there's that, you can kind of take that fuzzy math into account, but you're also like looking at enabling those um, first and last mile barrier things too, which could connect much longer trips. So there's a lot to be learned there. I know the AMP the AMP group is uh, focusing on those and that and what's available and how, how those trips are impacting the whole system. Here's Starker. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Very interesting. In your analysis of, uh, of phone usage and, and the data that you're able to, to acquire from that, do you see a, a time in the future, maybe not too far, that that data is collected by the vehicle itself? and will enhance sort of our ability to, to gather, gather data and project on that. 
Mr. Chair and Director, yeah. So actually, a lot of more modern vehicles um, are, are able to, to collect and report data without um, cellular devices now. So um, those are, are gradually increasing along with the, the sample that we have of cell phone data. I'll just add to that. Just on top of that, um, you know, people talk a lot about autonomous vehicles, but connected vehicles is probably coming much sooner. And it's already here a lot. And as those sample sizes of connected vehicles grow, the data is far exponentially more accurate than a cell phone, like doing probe data, right? So you're getting real road brake movements and things like that. So once once that data starts coming into the system, and it's already being done in China a lot, I think, like you, you can do a lot of these things much better to optimize the system. Any other questions or comments? Director Bidham. Um, I found your uh, comments about uh, the digital twin study that was done in Chattanooga really <laughs> fascinating. And is there anything else that you could uh, tell us about that? Yeah, so I, I will say, Ms. Mr. Chair and Director, um, that you know, that it was a pretty high level analysis provided by NREL. Um, they didn't go into too much granularity, but um, what, we, what we can say is that they used uh, cell phone data, connected vehicle data, and, and they also deployed some on network sensors um, that, so they, they sort of stitched all of those together to, to create that micro model. Um, so, and yeah, they, I, they mentioned the use of machine learning, which is, is something we're, we're growing to understand as planners. Um, so yeah, and more to come there. Um, I, yeah, we're going to be keeping an eye on um, NREL and DOE to see if they release anything new. All right. Thank you very much. Really appreciate your presentation. Thank you. Next up, the update on the Land Use and Transportation Connection Technical Assistance Pilot. Uh, Emily Dasher and Dylan McBride, planners uh, with regional planning and development. Good evening, and thank you for being here. Uh, good evening. Thank you. Um, my name is Dylan, uh, and this is Emily. We're on the regional planning team here at Dr. Cog. Um, we just wanted to chat with you about a program that we administered this past year, the Transportation Land Use Connection Technical Assistance Pilot, which has always been a mouthful. Fine. Um, so in, from May of 2022 to May of 2023, Dr. Cog engaged uh, local governments uh, with a technical assistance program. So what we were trying to do is uh, find new ways that we could administer some of the, uh, the procurement uh, on behalf of local governments, but also look at how we can uh, support some of the great local planning work that's already happening in the region um, and find new ways that we can um, basically spur uh, uh, different types of, of planning work and so we wanted to pilot this technical assistance program. And so we looked at plan reassessments to identify maybe barriers to prior planning work and um, seeing if there's uh, opportunities for looking at implementation. Uh, we wanted to focus on projects that had a land use transportation, so things that were looking at walkability or improved um, uh, connection to other modes uh, or other land uses. So, um, and then the other thing was we wanted to look at how we could um, administer the contracts on behalf of local governments with consultants. So we looked at reassessments because we had a relatively quick timeline. We had to spend basically all of our funding by June of 2023, um, and we only had about $150,000. So we were looking at how can we provide a lot of value in a short amount of time. So we said, instead of looking at starting brand new plans from the ground up, Let's look at maybe where there's ways that we can look at prior planning work and look at you know what's changed since the uh, plan happened. You know we all experienced the global pandemic and uh, new ways of of getting around. Um, so we said maybe there's opportunities to reassess some of this work and find uh, opportunities to look at getting restarted with implementation. 
Yeah, so um, the, with those program goals in mind, we started by trying to cast a really wide net and letting our local governments know about this opportunity. And we had an informational webinar to inform them about the details of this, this new program. Um, and in addition to a lot of the procurement um, assistance we wanted to provide, we also took tried to take some of the legwork out of the um, finding the consultants part. Um, and so we went through and researched and made a list of all of the land use and transportation consultants we could find um, to hopefully match our local governments up with the right expertise for these kinds of projects. And so once these projects were selected, we bid them out, and then we worked with the local governments to uh, make sure that that was the right consultant for them. So what projects did we select? Um, so we selected a project in Arvada, in Adams County, and in Englewood. Um, these projects all had completely different implementation challenges. In Arvada, there was a lot of planning happening there um, pre-pandemic. They were focusing on Old Town. They were focusing on Ralston Road. They had this whole um, mixed-use multimodal corridor plan for Ralston Road, um, connecting a lot of the neighborhood amenities to Old Town. And the pandemic really interrupted a lot of that implementation work. So their goal was to reassess based on this new post-pandemic reality and um, hopefully help the community really realize the original vision that they had for Ralston Road. In Adams County, there were delays in the opening of two of the stations, um, Federal and Pecos Junction stations. And as a result, the, a lot of the um, development that they had planned there really didn't materialize. So for them, it was about getting that back um, up and running. And then in Englewood, they had a um, station area plan that was completed in 2013 in downtown Englewood. And unfortunately, that plan didn't really have a lot of information on connecting key multimodal corridors. It didn't have any feasibility about uh, information about feasibility of development around surrounding land use and it lacked a, an implementation plan altogether. So they really wanted to fill in those gaps. So for the Adams County project, um, there was um, a lot of reevaluation of their original plan that was completed in 2009. They um, wanted to look, re -look, you know, kind of recalculate these existing conditions. What's the land use? What's the transportation around these stations since 2009? Um, and the recommendations for this plan, which was done by Bohan and Houston, really um, look to encourage opportunities for development by looking at the connectivity, the zoning, the land use, even things like land, um, floodplains and landfills um, to hopefully find ways that they, the, the county could encourage more development. Um, and then also they are looking at exploring the creation of an overlay zone for these two station areas to again, encourage that transit-oriented development. So, as Emily mentioned, in Arvada, uh, they were trying to reassess some of the planning work that they had done um, for Old Town and along Ralston Road specifically. So, in 2007, there was a transit area framework plan that was going along with the addition of the new G-Line. And then in 2010, the Urban Renewal Authority was doing a plan that was looking at Old Town and investments in the area. And then, in 2018, they updated their land use code and envisioned a mixed use multimodal corridor along Ralston Road and began doing some transportation improvements. The pandemic hit and they noticed some drastic changes to commercial and just some of the uses that were kind of coming in and they weren't seeing as much of the development occurring that they were anticipating along Ralston Road. So their reassessment looked at, you know, what's changed, what's feasible, and they also wanted to try and get back to the vision that the community had originally outlined for Ralston Road. So what they did was they kind of focused their recommendations in the reassessment around two specific uh, categories. So pedestrian-friendly design, the map on the right kind of shows site-specific areas in which they focused. These are opportunities to really drill down and invest in pedestrian enhancements, both along the corridor and for crossing. So kind of connecting neighborhoods to Old Town and kind of helping connect the community more uh, seamlessly to the G-Line and other transportation investments that have already been occurring. And then the other sort of category was development and redevelopment opportunities. So this map kind of shows like where they kind of drilled into specific areas that maybe there's 
underused parcels or areas that they can kind of enhance some of the land use to kind of you know support better transportation improvements along the corridor. Oh, sorry, I should also mention that uh, Arvada was actually featured uh, in uh, Dr. Cog's Civic Academy, this past Civic Academy, uh, as an example of some great uh, land use transportation planning work. So in Englewood, as I mentioned, their original plan was falling short, particularly when we're talking about multimodalism. And so the, this plan focused on breaking up Englewood Parkway um, into six segments and then providing short-term improvements for multimodalism and safety for each of these six segments. Um, and each of those segments also include next steps for implementation. And then to add to the multimodal and land use vision of the corridor, uh, they had a long-term visioning um, component to the plan. It featured four themes as identified through a collaborative visioning process. And the four themes were multimodal corridor improvements, placemaking, trail connectivity, and then parks and landscaping. So the final project was really focused on being an implementable and comprehensive look at the corridor. So we're, we'll wrap it up here. Um, we just wanted to say, first of all, that we really enjoyed being able to work on these projects. And it was really great to get to work with local government planning staff and finding out more ways that we could support them. Um, we've built some great relationships with those folks. Um, but we also had some, some lessons learned. And the first thing was like quick wins are really important um, for local governments and being able to have a small cost associated with you know, huge implementation measures, these plans are already, you know, reaping the benefits of this has been great. Um, second, uh, we were able to learn how, how we can do procurement to help better support local government work and ease that burden off of them. And then we also learned how can we ask, like ask better questions at the beginning of the process so that way we can have better outcomes at the end. So we can see better what success is going to look like. All of these takeaways are going to inform our upcoming uh, livable center set aside, which is going to focus on small area planning in our um, local governments. And uh, it will hopefully be launching uh, early next year. So we will take questions. Thank you. One comment before I go to Director Mahal to uh, uh, the, the quick wins being important as a local elected, I, I can't agree more. The, the, yeah, there are these big projects that seem awesome and, and people get excited by, but they're so far down the line that being able to deliver some of those wins just to make people feel that there's that momentum is just hugely important. Director. Uh, Oops. Two questions you wish you'd uh, ask up front. I know for, for me, the big one was like, how do you actually envision success? You know, we asked them, what do you want to like implement or like, how are you going to use this? But that's a different question than what does success look like for you? Yeah, I think um, kind of similar vein to Emily and something we kind of flagged there, which was, you know, how do you think through like what implementation looks like and maybe like, you know, this was an opportunity for us to study what were barriers and what's changed in some of those planning efforts. Some of them were, you know, nearly a, a decade old or more at some of this time. And so trying to think through, like, what was the mentality of that time and, like, how do we kind of update our information to kind of correlate? And then thinking through what does implementation kind of look like from there. Dr. Aricio. Yeah. <clears throat> some of the analysis that was done on identifying these two um, uh, stations and the and the and the I would say the, the delay in getting some of the development around the area did indeed involve uh, analyzing the, and identifying the fact that we have some uh, floodplain issues. We also have some um, issues environmental because some of those areas had uh, landfills in them. Uh, these are particularly interesting because we're in unincorporated areas of the county that cities have not wanted to take on for annexation. And so in order for us to develop around these stations, or in order for us to be able to remediate some of those challenges, some of them natural and some of them man-made from the past, we discovered that it would be good to have a tool uh, for tax increment financing that counties can use much like cities can use. And so you're gonna see us pushing and advocating for a bill that allows counties to do the same thing that cities can do, 
but within unincorporated areas that won't impact the cities. And I think that that is something that you're going to hear about over the next year and in the session. Um, there are some folks that are generally get bristled at the thought of tax increment financing discussions. Um, but I would ask that you come talk to us because this type of analysis that was done here really helped us highlight how some counties have these situations and when we don't have the tools that cities do, but we may need them to help with these things, it's a good thing and it won't negatively impact cities. So if you hear any questions about it, you hear any concerns, please, please, please come talk to me. Uh, our cities are, are recognizing the importance of this as well, uh, but there are some folks out there that want to rehash 10 and 15 year old fights that most of us weren't even in office at that time. So please come chat with me. Thank you. <laughs> Director Walton. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I wanted to be sure to recognize the staff tonight on my way out the door. Um, we know who does the work around here, right? And I, I so appreciate the opportunity to meet more staff and, you know, we see the usual suspects here. Hi, everyone. Um, but it's really nice to see some new faces. I always have enjoyed that opportunity. When I Thank you very much for the presentation. I'm hearing some enthusiasm in your presentation. It seems like it was a really fun project. So I'm sure there, there were maybe more than just the two of you. So please extend my thank yous. Um, I wanted to ask and see, um, coming from Lafayette, you know, the challenge of, uh, you know, deep staff doesn't always, um, you know, opportunities like this, th there might be a capacity issue for kind of signing up and being interested or, and being able to participate. Um, so in some of, some of these kind of cases, we might be um, having a consultant do a lot of work. Is there anything in this pilot or as you roll things out that you would be working not just directly with municipalities and gov local governments, but also with consultants who are informing and be that's where um, some of the meatiest, meatiest <laughs> kinds of opportunities and implementation some of the things you've considered here um, might come to a smaller community. Thank you for both the comments and the question. Um, so I'll just start with saying um, yes, I, I agree. I think that, um, so in this particular case, um, we did work with consultants to kind of support uh, these projects. And I think um, you're, you're right. And so, so one of the things that we were also trying to test with Dr. Cog holding the contract with consultants and I think this is something I forgot to mention, but I, I think it's important to flag, is that we also know that procurement's tough for local governments and especially smaller local governments or maybe smaller staff um, and for going after smaller pots of funding. Like this was $50,000 per project. And so like the opportunity cost sometimes doesn't necessarily shake out for folks to kind of chase after these types of projects. But we also know that they have a high return on investment for trying to get the projects or plans to the next stage. And so that was part of what we were also trying to test is like, can we help um, offset some of the burden on local governments by doing some of that work ourselves so that then we can connect them with the consultants faster and then they can just work directly with the consultants on getting to the next steps, implementation, the planning work. Jersey. Yes, thank you. Uh, I appreciate you bringing up the procurement process and I wonder if you heard from any of these municipalities or if you're considering in that process um, a value system rooted in supporting women and minority-owned businesses in that process. That had, so for this round, that, that was not something that we had considered, but I really appreciate that comment, and we can see how we can work that into the livable centers uh, set-aside process moving forward. Thank you. Cameron, if I may, I might just comment on that. It's actually, it's very timely. Sheila and I had a conversation specific to that uh, yesterday, and uh, it's something we need to we need to dive a little deeper in our procurement process. Um, there's there's some limitations sometimes with regards to it, you know the insurance that's required you know to be able to compete as part of our procurement. We need to get a better understanding if that's something that's being dictated to us through the federal government or is it just ours. So that's something we're going to work on. I also just want to add quick. I know I think at least one of the consulting firms had a woman as a as a co-owner and multiple or at least two of them i think so it was just a happy coincidence though it wasn't uh, necessarily planned that way any final questions emily and dylan thank you very much great presentation really appreciate your time
I, I want to amplify what Director Walton said about how staff is always incredible and impressive, and it is great seeing new uh, presentations and new folks, and we do look forward to seeing more and more from, from you know, some very talented planners and, and other staff. Uh, informational items, I'll call to your attention, uh, item number 13, administrative modifications for the 2024-2027 Transportation Improvement Program, uh, and then also item number 14, the draft 2024 policy statement of state legislative issues. Would encourage you to work with your staffs in terms of any feedback for Rich and, and uh, our, our uh, legislative folks in terms of any possible changes to that draft statement. Uh, with that, we will move ahead to committee reports. We will start with a report from the State Transportation Advisory Committee, Mr. Nicholas Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The stack met in November. Full agenda, I'm going to touch on two items. Both are uh, items I've talked about given progress reports and previous updates. First up, the HB 2311-01 TPR boundary update. So this was uh, a uh, piece of legislation that recommended analysis should the TPR transportation planning region boundaries be updated. Uh, gone through a, a number of different engagements with that. Ultimately, the stack recommended opposing changes um, to any of the TPR boundaries keeping the status quo. Well, status quo, we're going to say that a few times today. Finally, moving on to program distribution formulas. We've gone through a number in previous meetings. These were the final. This included the faster safety funding, uh, congestion mitigation air quality funding, metro planning, STBG urban, and the carbon reduction programs. Stack rec recommended maintaining status quo for the faster safety and CMAC programs. Uh, more discussion around the metro planning funding. These are funding, if we think about our UPWP, this is primarily what, what funds those activities in there. Uh, Stack recommended what was termed a modified status quo uh, option that distributed funding by total MPO area population using updated 2020 census data with the state providing uh, uh, state planning dollars to backstop some of the recommendations um, for the different MPOs as may be needed. And finally, STBG urban and the carbon reduction programs are distributed through federally defined formula, so no recommendation asked for or made by the committee. And to report, Mr. Chair, happy to answer any questions. Very much. Moving ahead, uh, moving ahead uh, to Mayor Bud Starker, report from Metro Mayor's Caucus. Uh, thank, you, Mr. thank you, Mr. Chair. The uh, caucus has not met since our last uh, meeting here, so we have no report tonight. Thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, report from Metro Area County Commissioners. Uh, Director Teal is not here. Do we have any other uh, county commissioners who would have a report? Uh, Director Baker. Yes, I just wanted to say we'll be, Mac will be meeting in this room on Friday with a special guest, Denver Mayor Johnson. Thank you very much. Report from the Advisory Committee on the Aging, Shayla Sanchez Warren. Shayla. Good evening. Uh, so uh, we had kind of one primary presentation at the Advisory Committee on Aging about upcoming opportunities for area agencies on aging. I want to give you a little background. As you may, be re uh, as you may remember, we have been working uh, to diversify our funding sources in the area agency on aging to keep p pace with the needs of a growing older population in the region. We've participated in several federal demonstration programs. We participate on national committees and work groups. Um, we're really at the forefront of efforts to improve health outcomes by addressing health-related social needs. In order to capture some of the new money coming from foundations and eventually Medicare in a few years, we've been working to be designated as a community care hub. You may remember the presentation that AJ gave a while back at uh, a work session, I think. Um, we now have all the requirements to be a designated community care hub. So that means a network of community organizations that provide services to address health-related social needs who engage with the community. That's what an area agency on aging does. Experience working with healthcare providers, um, the infrastructure needed, which includes cybersecurity and HIPAA insurance, which believe me is a big deal, um, <laughs> payment and reporting systems, and then an interoperable system that can manage referrals, track services, service delivery, capture data on services, and integrate payment systems. 
because we've done this work, we now can apply for new funding. And we're going to do that um, in, uh, over the next few months. Uh, we're going to apply for $500,000 uh, from the U.S. Community Care Hub Center for Excellence that will help us improve our efforts. Um, we're going to apply to the Governor's Office of eHealth Innovation to help us build out that capacity of our interoperable, opera, interoperable system um, and maybe connect with uh, the be able to connect with hospitals, electronic health records, which is also a really big deal. Um, here's the, most, the one I'm most excited about, but it's the hardest. Uh, we've been invited by Robert Wood Johnson Health Equity Learning Collaborative to be a part of a new initiative um, that would develop a new care model, uh, the under Part B of Medicare, this requires us to come to the table with the healthcare, with healthcare partners, including a hospital, healthcare payers, healthcare providers like doctors' offices, and then community service providers. And the goal is to be able to work out service needs, costs, referral systems, payment systems, reporting, and contract requirements. We are developing our partnership now and will be applying to participate very soon. Um, the first year will be money for planning. There's actually money, yay. Here's the best part ever. The second year actually has money to implement and, and provide services, which is so hard to get to. Um, and that whole piece about implementation, I was so happy to hear in transportation there's so many planning grants out there for this kind of stuff, and we never get to the implementation part, so this is so important. And that's my report. Thank you very much. With that, we'll move ahead to the report from the Regional Air Quality Council. Doug Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. The Regional Air Quality Council met on November 3rd, and I'll just share a couple of items with you. One. Um, Robert Spots, our very own Robert Spots, uh, gave a presentation, an update to the board on the regional climate action planning work that we're doing. We, we're, the, as you recall, a lead agency on the EPA grant. Um, we also received, uh, for information and discussion only, the uh, upcoming uh, 2024 budget and work plan, which will be voted on at the next meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Next up, report from the E-470 Authority, Director Mulvey. E-470 did not have a meeting in November. Its next meeting is in December, so we'll have a report after that. Thank you very much. Report from the Colorado Department of Transportation, Darius Pacwa. I keep doing that. I keep stumbling over that. I apologize, Darius. Darius I, I had that Pacwa. same problem when I was a kid, too, so no, no worries, Mr. Chair. Um, Wanted to note a couple of items on projects within the uh, within the Denver region. Um, uh, yesterday, there was a celebration on the new uh, I-70 bridge over 36th Avenue bridge project. 32nd, sorry, did I say 37th? I said, all right, there are right, 32nd bridge. So um, uh, happy to report on that project. And the Mount Vernon emergency truck escape ramp is closed for um, uh, rehabilitation and to add uh, more features to that item on there. So we do have some articles on our website on uh, safe usage, especially for those taking freight through that corridor. Uh, the Transportation Commission workshop met today and the actual Transportation Commission meeting will be tomorrow. Uh, under consideration is the draft budget or the draft budget recommendation of about $2 billion for fiscal year 25. The final approval will be in spring uh, next year, but um, the Commission will be taking that up. Another item up for consideration is the interchange approval at the uh, Crystal Valley interchange in Castle Rock that uh, was presented on last month. Additionally, there was uh, presentations on the 1101 study and the re recommendations on that. It's anticipated that the Transportation Commission will open rules early next year to consider any possible changes, um, uh, whether administratively or to boundary changes um, based on that report and in compliance with statute. And there was a excellent presentation on state of good repair uh, and informational presentation on how CDOT um, 
maintains our roadway system, both from a engineering and project side and a maintenance side, and continuing discussion on the fee-based right-of-way access for installation of fiber networks in that right-of-way. And that concludes my report, Mr. Chair. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Darius. Appreciate that. Any questions? We will move ahead to the report from the Regional Transportation District. Brian Welch. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a short presentation. No, I don't. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> PowerPoints, we have about 100 <laughs> slides. A couple of quick things. Uh, just tonight, about 15 minutes ago, we launched a brand new RTD website. Please check it out. It has a... Um, Let's see, Deborah wanted me to make sure that I mentioned that it is using Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.2 and AA level. And I just looked at this. It also has incorporates a third-party tool called Accessible to provide more support for users who need accessibility assistance. All content is available in English, Spanish, and Chinese. Two other quick things. We have, rele we have uh, provided the Colorado Energy Office with a draft report on 2023 zero fare for better air, and so you'll be able to see that report soon. And then finally, Denver and RTD decided that we haven't messed up downtown enough with the 16th Street Mall. So next year, the board of directors last night, they gave preliminary approval to $150 million worth of track replacement all the way from the Auraria campus to 30th and Downing. That's a big, giant state of good repair project. Sorry about that, but you know, you gotta do it eventually. That's my report for tonight. Great. Thank you very much. Administrative items. Remember the parking pass if you're parked downstairs. Also, if you're parked downstairs, don't go outside because you won't be able to get in through the revolving door, go through the hallways, and leave breadcrumbs through that. Our next meeting is December 20th. Uh, also, thanks for your service to your communities. Thank you for your service to the region. Uh, we are so appreciative, and thanks to staff for all you do. With that, we are adjourned.